Now Secret Coastline. Foulness Island and Burnham on Crouch are the destinations as Chris Searle continues his tour of East Anglia's shore in a restored former lifeboat. Let's start then now. We're going to do a bit of mud hopping. Our objective is Battle Bridge, which is a very limited navigation of the River Crouch. And on the way there, we're going to take a shortcut across the top of the Maplin Sand. It's something we can only do at the very top of the tide. So everything depends on the skill of our navigator, Brian Navid. We have just passed the East Shoebury Beacon, and we're about to turn across the sand. So I. ATA at the bridge about half an hour, I should say. Is that all right? Thanks very much indeed. We hope to take our retired lifeboat, Redundant Hero, along the overland route. OK, this is the difficult bit. We're now turning to port and crossing the Maplin Sands, heading for the Haven Gore Bridge. OK. What course so do you want, then? The course we want is 340. Macklin Sands rings the bell, isn't that where they were going to have an airport once upon a time? They were going to have an airport, but uh, the idea has now been uh, dropped. Speaking as a local resident, I think that's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've got so well, 30, difficult with this compass, but 35, do you? 34. Speed her up then, Chris, and... Uh, right, here we go then. We weighed anchor off South End three hours before high water. We intend to cut round the back of the Foulness firing range and creep up the crouch to the very limit of navigation. We've taken a, what is literally a 20 mile short cut, or rather we've cut off 20 miles from the normal route that you go into the River Crouch. You have to go right to the top end of Foulness Island, normally and all the way down the River Crouch. But this is the way, this, this 20 mile shortcut depends on the tide being right. That's and right. And it also depends on somebody knowing how to navigate properly so we don't go aground, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right, well, I, you haven't got your fingers crossed, have you? Uh, never do, no. <laughs> I we, have every confidence in you, Brian. We do have five feet of water underneath, oh. anyway. So plenty, I, of, plenty of room. And you've rung the bridge, so we can expect that little bit to, what's it going to do, go up or go that way or what, or that way? Well, we'll find out when we get there. <laughs> At low water, the trip looks impossible. A dry riverbed leads to a drawbridge, or more accurately, a lifting bridge, which isolates the lonely island of Foulness from nearby urban Essex. The river forms a protecting muddy moat around the secret testing sites where experiments with guns and rockets take place but it's very shallow in places. Yeah, I can actually feel the rudder touching now when we're in, according to the echo sounder, zero feet of water. Just I'm just feeling it bumping on the bottom. Into the creek. Well, it's lucky it's not rougher water. That's right. And only for the season and experience, navigator and explorer. Let's down a bit, Chris. Let's down. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Turn immediately Brian left Rushley, here, That's Rushley Island is ahead. Right. So we turn left. And which bank do we stay on on this uh, uh, stay stretch? On the, uh, stay on the left-hand side. Okay. Closer to the left-hand side, anyway. We'll have a look at the sound at 15 feet nearly now. Oh, that's good. So we're in 15 feet of water now. So we're over the top. It's not quite high water. So the whole of this labyrinth of uh, waterways is filled with water now. For the short time, a couple of hours or so.
hardly surprising the Ministry of Defence use it for secret testing. It's very difficult to reach, even by boat. That looks ominous. Brooks, I think we've gone aground. Oh. Let's see if I can do a bit of backwards. Counted. Yes, absolutely in zero water. I think the channel must be on that side. Right, well, if I can go back out straight. Go back out again. Wasp in here. Are we moving? I wonder if they're trying to tell us something. The casual visitor is not encouraged. It's a firing range where live ammunition is tested. The public are only permitted to use the waterway when the guns and rockets are silent. But today we are allowed on the island with an escort to help us stay on the straight and narrow. Even the church is unusual. The spire is leaning because of the subsidence of the waterlogged land. And the peaceful landscape seems understandably undisturbed. You need a pass to get here, so this is a public house with private patrons. The locals really are local. But why all this secrecy? Why all this big notices and the police and so on? Well, this is a, a Ministry of Defence explosive trials range, and the main reason we exclude the public is for their own safety, because um, as it has been used for gunnery and explosive trials from uh, the mid-19th uh, century, no one really knows what is buried under the sand. And yet, you have a local population on the island of how many about? About 250. Including farmers? Farmers, and but, but all the farmland has been cleared and uh, the local population are well aware of where they can go and where they can't go. So Roger, as a local farmer, uh, I suppose you feel there's a slight <laughs> risk when you're ploughing up a field. You might need a bomb or a mine or something, is there? Well, occasionally, I mean, you come across a piece of shrapnel from, I mean, the war when they fired a lot of explosives in a hurry to solve a lot of problems. And, uh, but it's really pretty safe. I mean, we've been here quite a few years. I've been here since 1945, and well, I haven't had any problems myself. The noisy neighbours work to a timetable set by the tides. The guns point out to sea, and the spent shells are retrieved when the tide goes out. And when someone says it's your round, it could mean anything. could be classed as a little piece of heaven to some people, but uh, in the wintertime it's a bit remote. But, uh, you know, it's quite nice to have the security and go out uh, away from the island without worrying about the farm being set about by vandals. Or... There is only one road onto the island, and that's guarded by a police force. Friends have to give notice of any visit, and only close relations can come and go freely. But everybody needs a pass to get on and off the island. Civil liberties might be a bit low on the menu, but there's no need to lock a door or fit a car alarm. And there's not much point in having a fast car. The island is only five miles from end to end. There is one small village, sandwiched among the blockhouses, the hush-hush laboratories and the firing ranges. But some live here all year. They've come to accept the restricted and often noisy way of life. It's an ironic contradiction that this blast-streaked island doubles as a sanctuary for birds and animals. The wildlife is far more tolerant of the gunfire than the more usual interference of us humans. You 
must get disturbed sometimes. Do you ever get to...? Yes, we get them. My particular farm gets a tremendous amount of disturbance. Um, we do get evacuated times for four or five hours in the midday when we're trying to farm, but I'm afraid we have to accept that if we want to stay here. And uh, you do choose to stay here? Oh, certainly. I wouldn't live anywhere else. I mean, this is my home. Full stop. Uh, I couldn't say couldn't live anywhere else. I probably could, but my heart is here, and that's that, because I'm involved in the farm and conservation side of it, and I'm a lucky man. But in 1953, the luck ran out. The island had been reclaimed from low marshland and protected by an earth bank. The storms broke through and the whole island returned to the sea. As with much of East Anglia that year, the houses were half submerged and the farmland soured by salt water. But in spite of that and in spite of all the bureaucracy and the rigmarole and the Ministry of Defence and all the rest of the things you have to deal with, you still enjoy living here? Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, we're, we're pretty tough out on the East Coast. I mean, uh, we, we survive, you know. Then you've, uh, you've navigated us to, uh, to Burnham on Crouch, and uh, here comes the marina now. Now, this marina was designed for yachts with easy manoeuvrability, the sort of yacht that can turn on a six, but this is a 47-foot Watson lifeboat. It's the opposite of turning on a six, but it's like turning on, turning on a football pitch. How are we going to get in? Well, I think, I mean, Burnham, you, you, the new yacht harbour of Burnham has got quite a lot of elbow room, so uh, I think we're quite lucky there. I think you sh it shouldn't be too difficult, hopefully. Well, we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens. I hope those aren't your famous last words. I'm beginning to feel a little more confident handling a boat that only wants to go in a straight line, although every time we park Redundant Hero, it is an adventure. nice to get away from the sound of gunfire. When the barge trade deserted Burnham, recreational sailing took over. Because the waters around here are so difficult, the local sailing men had developed particular skills, and that's why in the 1920s and 30s, the rich and famous came here to get crews to man their vast racing yachts. Even now, many of the men working along this foreshore are asked to join the elite in competitive sailing and represent their country all over the world. Now, Tubby Lee, great to meet you. I've been looking forward to this because you're a real kind of link with the yachting past history, aren't you, in a way? I'm not, not, that, not that long ago, but, you know, long enough to, to notice the difference. I mean, when did you start in the, in the sailing game? Well, I mean, actually, sailing was what... Uh... So in the 1950s, as a boy, just a just a boy, you know, on a a gap uh, cutter, just to virtually uh, be skipper's mate and do all the running about odd jobs and cleaning the brass, scrubbing the decks, and this uh, was as a school. This was before you left school. Well, that was actually when I left school. You know? As a school leader. Yeah, but I mean the actual how I got the bug is, is the wording I suppose really is that. Uh, I kind of looked after dinghies for yacht owners in my spare time when I was a school lad, and I'm, I was there in there weekends and you know holidays and everything else. And I mean, I I was always down there. And my parents never knew where I was, you know, and I just <laughs> fell in love with the with the river. When Ted Heath found politics too peaceful and turned to competitive sailing. He recruited part of his winning team from these waters. And he really did give two hoots about winning. What was Edward Heath like to sail with? Oh, he was a yachtsman who you respected. And there was only one thing in his mind, he had to win. 
at any cost. I mean, you know, there were no excuses or anything else. Did that make him a tough master? Oh, yes. I mean, the thing was that uh, he, he just, you know, he kind of wanted to know everything that went wrong if he didn't win. And if he did everything right, well, he was a happy man. But when you've been doing it for nearly, what, 35 years or something like that, I mean, you know what to expect. And I mean, yacht racing is like, it's not boring because every race is different. And it's a challenge. And I mean, if you're competitive and want to win, the thing is that you know that the boat has got to be pushed to its limits for 24 hours a day and that the people who are on, actually on the part of the team, they've all got to be in the same frame of mind. And if, there's, if people are going to go to sleep and, you know, and, and dream about their girlfriends and, you know, wish they'd be back in the pub, well, they didn't want to be offshore. It's the will to win, isn't it? That's right. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that's what Cherry Blythe told us as well, you know. Yeah, well, that's If right. you don't want to win, there's no point in going. No, that's great. Well, now we're taking ourselves right up to the shallowest bits of the river crowd, right up to the headwaters as far as traffic will go, in the company of the man who lives right there in a mill he built himself, Roy Hart. Now, Roy, how difficult is this river to get up? Um, to the whole bridge, quite easy, actually. You've got a few more boats you have to kind of uh, negotiate, and with the flood tide under the stern, you, you have to know what you're doing. But past Hull Bridge, um, it's rather tricky. Uh, well, really... that's where we're going to need your expertise and your experience, because you've done well, this river many, many times. But uh, yeah. how, it, it's tricky, is it? Well, we usually get there. <laughs> One out of three, I think. Is that, that's the best chances you can offer us, well, is it? I, 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 th I think, I think, um, I think we should get there today. I hope so. I'd be very embarrassed to run you aground. And you used to uh, you used to trade up here, didn't you? You had actually had the world's only sailing trader. Well, that's that's right. Yes, the sailing barge May was the only boat under sail with our great maritime nation left which she has to carry a cargo once a year and um, we used to carry moon boots from France to Battlesbridge <laughs> and I actually had the village declared an official port. They say it's better to travel than to arrive, but not on this narrow and shallow river. Our destination is the old trading quay at Battlesbridge. We don't get that many yachts up there, actually. Don't you? No. Well, this is hardly a yacht, but... Well, uh, this would certainly be the first lifeboat. I was going to say, when was the last time you had a lifeboat? Yeah. I think and, uh, some of us need rescue in there, you know. This is called Long Pole Reach, yeah, because it was a bit deeper. And the next one round is called Short Pole Reach, because okay. they had to change. It's when they used to huff all the barges up here. Yeah. Well, to the left, yeah. What into the bank? Close to the no, bank. No, just bare left. Yeah. I'll tell you when to straighten up. This is the shallowest bit of the crouch. This piece here. I've seen many boats here stranded for weekends at yeah. the time. for inviting me on board, Chris. Well, thank you for all your help, Roy. Yeah. My goodness, I don't think... We're not going to get any more difficult waterways than that, are we, on the coast no. of East Anglia? Had a bit of luck there, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant. We didn't touch once. Didn't touch once. Didn't yeah. even need the lead line. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. What a lovely spot. It's rather nice. Beautiful. Our river pilot, Roy Hart, claims to have the only snow skiing shop sighted below sea level. In fact, part of the mill was built only a couple of years ago. The planners took Roy to court 
and he got the option of 30 days in jail or a 250 pound fine. He paid the money. Strangely, now the paint is dry, it's been designated as a listed building. And why the name Battles Bridge? Apparently in Victorian times, the area was owned by the Battiel family, who combined the unlikely skills of farming with civil engineering. The result was a new iron bridge over the Crouch and a new name for the village. But Battles Bridge has even stranger things to offer. Take a pew can have a literal meaning here. Antique dealers, bric-a-brac experts, junk collectors, the Essex punter hunting out that unrecognized rare antique, all are here. I wonder if there's something here for our lifeboat. They say some antique dealers have sharp teeth. Surely not here. This is a real life land of Lovejoy, and I'm looking for a Lovejoy look-alike, Jim Galley. So basically it's what? It's furniture and, and bric-a-brac, dare I say it. That's probably yeah. a bad word to an no, antique dealer, no, right? No. And, uh, and that's it, basically, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, we uh, we've got a few craft workshops, um, restoration workshops, some reproductions as well. Great. Obviously, that's the sort of happy band of people all with the same, oh, yeah. all their minds on yeah. the same thing. Now then, have you got anything to suggest that we might take for the redundant hero? Well, I just happen to have here this foghorn. Oh, it's a foghorn. It's <laughs> a, it's it's a looks, a like, a co looks like a coffee machine. Let's have a look. Right, have a go. See if you can make it oh, work. Blimey. What do I do? Set you off a ten sailing barge. Is think. it really? <laughs> all right for sound. Okay for level, a little bit more. <laughs> Foggy night. Certainly works. That's great. I like that. That's terrific. Anything else we might be interested in playing with here? Ah, oh, something might interest you. We've got an old motorcycle or two. Have you? Mm -hmm. Hey, yes, that appeals to me very strongly. Would you like a ride? <laughs> yeah, would I? Come on, let's go. Okay. Well, frankly, I haven't ridden a motorbike for years. Yes, and it shows. <laughs> Oh, it's a couple of start. I wasn't going anywhere anyway. Oh, go on, let the expert have a go. Go on, you start. Now. Oh, we made a fan. Oh, you see, it's a gift. It's a gift. No, it's not. <laughs> well, you've broken my bike! <laughs> hey, well done, well done. Oh, right, now then. Oh, 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 oh. Which way is that? Which way is that? Which way bike on the boat unfortunately next week we're back on the water to find one of the loneliest places on the east coast redundant hero will be visiting Ozi Island and the River Blackwater In fact, Secret Coastline returns in two weeks, at the slightly earlier time of 